Let's go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone to Grow Your Business in Uncertain Times. This is a five-part series. It's uh, not buildable contents represented by the shift spot. So um, feel free to jump in any and all of these. Uh, we will send recordings out on these events. And if you want to invite any friends, CEOs or business owners, feel free to do that as well. This is what this is targeted for, is for owners of the company, if you will. So a little bit about myself, right, and my bio. I'm not going to read through all the slides, but uh, my, my name is Ken Paskins. I'm your host today. Um, over the past eight years or decade or so, I've been operating as, as what a lot call a, a hired gun. So what does that mean? Operating as a CEO slash COO, and generally I will drop into companies, uh, a lot of the target market that I drop into to assist are companies 50 million below. I would say the sweet spot has really been pre-revenue to 10 million, uh, working with some companies up to 250 million. Worked in a variety of different industries, so you you name it, I've been there. CPA firms, law firms, SaaS, uh, marketing agencies, a lot in that, what I call the chaos industries, and that's my term that I coined if you haven't heard of that. But uh, the chaos industries are companies such as HVAC, landscaping, construction, roofing. You know, these are companies that have high profitability, lots of cash flow, explosive growth but they're continuously running around like uh, chickens with their heads cut off, right? So, um, and, and they lack some of, the, uh, some of the areas of discipline, such as, uh, you know, um, uh, systems and processes and things of that nature. So um, I come from three generations of entrepreneurs, right? And when I grew up, it, a lot of it was boom and bust. So my father was in the restaurant business. He, um, he uh, worked a good uh, 90 hours a week. I never really saw him. And uh, there were often times where, you know, I would go to Vail with the family and money would fall out of the sky. And then three months later, I'd come back and another restaurant would go in and put one of his out of business. And suddenly my mom was trying to borrow some money for the phone bill. So my, my father was always one of those CEOs that are business owners that put all the money on Black 32. So sometimes he won and uh, oftentimes he lost. And experiencing that, I knew that I wanted to go out and learn from professionals, learn from others, and gain that experience prior to doing something on my own. So a couple of statistics that I want to go through, and uh, then we'll jump into things. But um, a little, some people don't know this, but if you look at Forbes, if you look at Chamber, and if you look at Gallup, these are some of the stats that I'm going to pull from. But 98% of all companies out there are 100 employees or less. 89% are 20, 20 employees or fewer. 50% of companies fail or 18% of all companies fail after their first year in business. 50% fail after five years. All right. Business owners, 39% of work in the business, uh, more than 60 hours a week. And if you look at these business owners, uh, most of them, 50% of them are gaining all of their business acumen and experience of working within their own business. So what does that mean? I teach myself how to be a, become a leader. I teach myself about hiring and firing. I teach myself about systems and processes and marketing, right? That adds a great deal of expense and a, and a large amount of mistakes can be made. Let's look at some of the, uh, the uh, educational background, if you will, of the typical CEO or entrepreneur out there. 30% have a, have a high school degree, okay? 31% just have a, an associate degree. 18% um, shockingly to me have a bachelor's degree and the rest have either an MBA or greater. So what does this lead to? It, lead, it can lead to a lot of mistakes, if you will. And I've, I've walked, walked into companies where I started to see the same movie over and over again, where we're making decisions without data and facts and information, and that's a lot on gut. We're trying to scale our company by adding bodies, but not understanding you know, the value of systems and processes. Uh, not understanding how to properly uh, grow and mentor employees to help elevate them to the next level. So I wanted to create a community that would meet business owners wherever they were on their journey in a, in a cost-effective manner and supply them with expertise to help them along that journey. So thus, we created the Chef Spot. Just one small snapshot of this, and this is not going to be a sales presentation whatsoever, but on a monthly basis, we will surround you with experts. So this is an open event. Uh, and like I said, for the people that couldn't join today, they will get this, uh, this recording. 
but our our users will on a monthly basis be surrounded with experts around either marketing or leadership or those different areas this month is all about marketing right and next month is going to be around hr and human capital one of the things that is different about the shift spot unlike other uh op opportunities or options out there is we actually have an element of mind body and soul as well because we believe that become the best leader or ceo of a business that you've got to not only focus on the business ac acumen and discipline but you've got to have a focus on your mind body and soul also so during this today, uh, we're gonna we're gonna begin to dig into um, you know uh, how 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 to market your business during uncertain times, and I wanted to go ahead and introduce you to my friend and colleague, Ken Murray. Um, Ken is a fractional CMO. Uh, Ken has some amazing background. So Ken has about 25 years of experience as a CMO. He's been operating as a CMO in, in the mid-market space uh, with a company by the name of Chief, Chief Outsiders. So um, Ken is, is a, a, an avid cook, a skier, a biker, just like myself. We have a lot in common, minus the fact that Ken plays the banjo. So uh, one of his claim to fames, if you will, if you ever heard, and I, 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 I know that once we record this, it's going out on social media, so hopefully I don't embarrass myself too much, but he created a little uh, jingle, 1877 cash. <laughs> no, no, sorry, that's enough of my humor. <laughs> but uh, he created that little jingle, if you will, that uh, still wears on me today. And and I think about it every single time I see that commercial. But with all that said, you know, Ken, I want to turn it over to you. But before we jump into that, you know, marketing is a broad concept, right? And, and I'll be honest with you, it's an area that a lot of business owners get confused with, because a lot of times it's difficult to tie it to ROI. And if we bring a bunch of different marketers into a room, you know, we're going to get a bunch of different mar uh, uh, answers. So maybe you can help us just understand what marketing is, please. Yeah. So thanks for the introduction, Ken. It's great to be here. Uh, nice to meet uh, the folks who are on the call. Um, I did also uh, was hoping that you wouldn't sing, Ken, because I was fully prepared to belt out the uh, the opportune, but um, th thankfully I didn't have to. Um, right before we jump into marketing um, and what that is, um, you know, like Ken, uh, I'm a fractional guy. So I work with a company called Chief Outsiders and I've had, you know, great experiences leading marketing teams um, uh, for, for many years. But I'm now 100% focused on helping CEOs of middle market um, companies and typically our sweet spot's not dissimilar, you know, 5 million to 100 million. There's some pre-revenue, there's some... I, recently worked with a billion dollar company. It, it really just depends. But that five to 100 kind of middle middle market is definitely the sweet spot. And so we're 100 percent focused. There's about 120 uh, folks like me representing all industries, all verticals. Um, and, and we are part we go in, we become part of the leadership team. Um, and really, the focus is to build sustainable growth strategies. Right. Typically, we have a maybe a six to nine month engagement, and then uh, maybe uh, some advisory work after that. Some engagement lasts. Some engagements last many years. Some some are just projects. So it really just depends on on what the need is. Um, so why don't we get into what marketing is? And and I call this this is an I slide, right? Because there's a lot of words, and if you don't, you just sort of step back and say, well, I don't want to read all that, but. You don't have to because I'm going to dive into some of this a little bit in more detail. This is a good definition, by the way. All right, let's focus in on this. Um, I'll read it real quick. Marketing is a process of creating, communicating, delivering, and exchanging offerings that have value for customers, clients, partners, and society as a whole. It involves in the highlighted bits, as you might guess, they're really critical, right? It involves understanding and identifying the needs and wants of a target market. I'm going to stop there for a second. Um, the, we, we believe in something called, um, it's a process uh, called the growth gears, right? And there's three, really three of them. The first one of the growth gears is called insights. Okay, what do I need to know about my customers, my competitors, um, and myself, frankly? Without that, you're lost. And so that's why this 
piece is so critical, understanding, identifying the wants and needs of the target market, making sure I can meet those needs, right? Um, and in order to meet those needs, I have to have a strategy. I can't just like randomly try things. And we're going to talk about this in a future session, a random acts of marketing, because that's what most people practice. That's what most businesses practice. You need to build a sustainable strategy, right? That looks at markets, looks at your offering, looks at your positioning um, so that you can meet your customers' needs. The, the next important thing is it's dynamic, it's iterative, it's ongoing, right? It's not just sort of a set it and forget. I'm not just going to try one thing. Um, I'm not going to give up. It's dynamic and ongoing, and it's constantly evolving, right? It doesn't, it, it constantly changes. And so you need to be prepared to change with that. Um, it builds strong relationships. If your marketing isn't working hard, it's not going to build strong relationships with your customers. Um, you know, this is all about loyalty. And then probably the most important thing here is driving profitable business growth. That's what everyone wants. That's That's kind of a no brainer. But most people don't think about marketing as a core business strategy, as really part and soul of the business strategy. When you combine all the, the insights work, the strategy work, and so that you're driving execution because you're probably spending some money here, it is a core part of the business strategy and it drives profitable business growth. Um, I mean, th this makes sense. I mean, why, in your opinion, is marketing so hard for businesses? And and by the way, everybody, feel free to jump in and ask questions anytime you want or send them in through chat or at the end, just whatever you feel comfortable with. But why is it so such a challenge? And like I said, I think marketing is it's one of those areas that a lot of owners have the trouble understanding. Right. You get 20 different marketers in a room. You're going to get 20 different strategies. You're going to hear all AdWords, all LinkedIn, all social, all SEO, all this, all that. Yep. Uh, and it's also difficult a lot of times even tie the ROI to, right? I can tie metrics really easy to sales and IT and finance and other areas. So why is this so hard in your opinion? Well, uh, I, th I think you capped it, Ken. In, in a word, it's overwhelming, right? So this is just. Um, a few, I think there's a hundred here ultimately when this thing is done rolling through, uh, terms, processes that are all marketing related. You can kind of read through, I'm not gonna read this obviously, um, but you can read through some of them and see, you probably recognize some of them, you may be doing some of them, um, but it ultimately it's hard. It's hard to get your arms around this. It's hard to be good at any, if, you know, uh, let, let's think about, um, search engine optimization. We've all heard about that. How do you do that? Well, you better be pretty darn good at it. It's really important, but you also need not to get too confused or overwhelmed by it because there are lots of people in the outside world who can help you with something like search engine optimization um, pretty, pretty easily. I'm going to focus on, if you look at number four here, uh, artificial intelligence, AI. I mean, it's, it's in all the headlines. There, there's five stories a day in the Wall Street Journal. Um, it's a scary thing if you're a CEO. It's like you're like, well, what what do I do with this? And by the way, uh, is it going to replace my people? And your people are thinking, is this going to replace me? And I will tell you, um, it's here to stay. It's just one of a hundred of these terms. Um, and I used AI to build this presentation, right? So, am I an AI expert? No. But guess what? There's a lot of resources available where you can learn, and there. Be just like any other new sort of thing or technology, there are hundreds, thousands, now tens of thousands of people who are becoming experts uh, across all kinds of uh, you know, realms of, of business here. So um, it is, I, back to your question, Ken, what, what makes this so hard is it's overwhelming, right? And it's not just these terms. If you work in, look at, this is another eye chart, right? Intentionally so. These are, this is a sampling of technologies that are used in marketing and literally thousands of choices to perform hundreds of potential tasks, all of which are important, right? We're talking about reaching my customer, reaching my prospects, generating visitors, getting people to take action, user experience, converting them into sales, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
you know, you've, you've heard, you, it's difficult to see this, but you see these blue clouds, that's Salesforce, okay? Salesforce does a lot of this. There's Google, you've heard of that. You've heard of, you know, several, men, men, probably many of these technologies, but you step back and you say, this is overwhelming. It's complex. How does it interface with my other systems? Do I need specialists on my team that can operate these things? At the end of the day, and it's expensive, you know, that this whole thing is very expensive. What what should I do? And what I like to say is, you know, it's kind of like what if you're a football fan, what uh, Aaron Rodgers said about, you know, five or six years ago when the Packers, the Green Bay Packers started off the season. I don't know. They were like two and six or something. Um, And everyone in Green Bay was freaking out. And he was asked the question in the locker room after another loss, Aaron, you know, what, what are we going to do? Um, you know, or, or, or is the season a lost cause? And he basically said, relax. Okay. Just relax. And that's kind of the story here. It's like, you, you don't have to do everything, right? You don't have to get overwhelmed. You need to kind of step back and I have, um, I'm going to move on here, but yeah, but uh, but still, real quick, I mean that that's a lot of, and maybe you're getting to it. That's a lot of complexity. How do CEOs get their arms around all of that complexity? Well, the 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 point is, you you need to step back, right? You you can't get mired in all of this, um, because if you think about it, these these are a lot of decisions to make, right? Right. And if you if you don't, you, you can't make a decision without having the right information, right? And that goes back to the growth gears that I was talking about. You need to have the right insights. You need to build the right strategy. And then you n- need to figure out what resources do I need to execute against that strategy? You may yeah. need three of these things, right? You might You don't need all 100 or however many are here. You need to figure out what is most important. And you need to figure out what's the... What's the path to get there to where I'm going, right? It's not just about solving everything at one time. It's about having it's about a measuring having approach based right. on the right strategy with the right insor- insights powering your execution, okay? So one way to think about this is a, a really beautiful quote um, that I like from, from Steve Jobs, um, and it really focuses on s- simplicity. And he said, Sim- simple can be harder than complex. You have to work hard to get your thinking clean to make it simple. But it's worth it in the end because once you get there, you can move mountains. And that the second highlighted piece, I think, is the key. Um, you have to work hard to get your thinking clean to make it simple. Right. And that's kind of the out the really first step is not worry about all of the complexity. You are going to have to probably spend some money. You are probably going to need technology. You are going to need processes. You're going to need an email platform if you have customers. You need to make sure it's all synced together, but you need to make sure you step back and look at things holistically. Um, and if you think about what you know, Apple has done, you know, they, they build very complex hardware and they use very complex software but as a customer of their products i don't think it is that hard i think they've made it pretty easy i think their experiences in the apple store are really good right Right. not perfect um and i'm willing to pay a premium for that right um they they have figured it out and it's all about the the beauty of simplicity and how they have incorporated that throughout every single process of this of their company yeah. So, um, by the way, for uh, uh, Greg and Bruce, I see that just joined. If you have any questions throughout the session, don't don't hesitate to just uh, jump in or send in the chat or at the end. But you know, just can real quick. If we look at current times, I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty, right? So, granted, we've had decades of of uncertainty and everything, but uh, things are sh- shaky right now. We're not technically in a, a recession. And it's a bit stranger currently right now with the worker uh, participation rate. I think currently is like 68%. You would think it'd be easy to find people, but it's still not. Right. Uh, but still, there's lots of layoffs to be, you know, happening every day, specifically in high tech. Uh, yeah. Why invest in marketing right now? And why is this a good time? Well, I, 
I think the question is, I think I have a slide for this, right? Um, what we were talking about that, that complexity of marketing in the previous uh, slides, th those are some things that ultimately I can control, right? If I get my arms around it, if I, if I work with the right people, if I get enough information, I build out my strategy, I can control that and I can make, make sense of that and make the right investment decisions to make it work. What we're talking about here is things that are out of my control, right? I, I can't control what the inflation rate is. Right. I can't control my supply chain. Um, I, I can't control necessarily what's happening with uh, my employee base. Hopefully, I have more control over that. But, you know, uh, I don't know what my competition is. So we're really talking about things that are outside of my control. And I think that's a really important point here. Um, but maybe even more importantly is if you look at this chart. So. The red stars represent the 23 recessions that we've had since 1900, believe it or not. The blue bars are new businesses created during the decades in those you know, recessions. And the story really is that the Ameri and this is in America, right, the US, the story is our economy is resilient, right? right. We, we figure it out. And by the way, we're gonna have more recessions. We may have one in a couple of months, we don't know. Um, it's gonna happen. It's kind of back to that Aaron Rodgers quote, you know, it's, you, you kind of have to relax a little bit. You have to be prepared. You have to make sure you're buttoned down, you know, pay the bills, et cetera, et cetera. But it's, it's inevitable. Right. And um, one of the things, these, these blue bars are new businesses, but there's another uh, sort of fact that's going on, and that is that companies that invest during tough times, we'll just call them tough times, are far more likely to grow to grow and then to grow profitably, and I have a statistic on this later, than those that don't, it, by, by a factor of five, okay? So that, that's, if you want the, the, the data, that's the data, but, but there's also some other reasons to do that, right? So maintaining your brand awareness. If, if you don't maintain your brand awareness during these downtimes, um, your customers and other prospects, they're gonna go somewhere else, right? They're right. still buying, they're not buying as much maybe, but they're still buying, they still need your services, right? Um, so it's a good time to not only create a business, but obviously invest and go past your competition as well, as long as you do it in, in an intelligent way, and, you know, you're looking at all the financial dials in, in your company. Yeah, I, I think that that's a really good point. You, you don't want to make bad decisions. You know, that it doesn't throw decision making out the window. It based, But, you know, you, you, you have a budget and, and you, you have to, you know, live within your means. Yeah. But you also part of what that is, part of what your budget should be is having a, a constant presence. Right. So not only that you can maintain your brand awareness, but you can attract new customers because there are going to be others who don't. There are going to be others who kind of freak out and won't spend, don't spend, do not do the things that are uh, appropriate to make sure that their brand awareness um, is, is maintained in the marketplace. Right. Um, the, the third thing really is, you know, you can build loyalty among your existing base by doing special things because you know what they're hurting too it's not just you everybody hurts in a recession and it's sort of a punch to the gut so how do you how do you make how do you do special things yeah. during this period so that you can build loyalty and then the most important thing this is the punchline is the huge opportunity to take share from your competition because at the end of the day this is a huge psychological phenomenon Human beings, it's not companies that are making decisions, it's the human beings in the companies that are making decisions, right? And you can get stuck in this sort of, um, you know, fear paradigm. Uh, you, you get paralyzed with indecision because I don't know what to do. I'm scared. And that's, it's perfectly re understandable. I yeah. get it, right? But if you can, again, make the right decision maintain your brand awareness, um, you can take share from your competition because you know there are gonna be some who don't. 
And yeah. this is here. Here's that data I was talking about. Um, this is a guy, uh, a UK researcher, Peter Field. He's done a lot of research on what happens economic activities during uh, recessions. And I'll just read it. Businesses that manage to increase their relative share of voice by 8% or more, okay, achieved four and a half times more market share growth, okay? Over a third of these businesses reported strong growth in profitability during the downturn, right? So it's not just I'm maintaining share and maintaining, you know, uh, I'm breaking even. They're increasing on nearly 40% strong growth in, in profitability. So if you do it right, there's an opportunity to really sort of leapfrog your competition. The yeah. last piece is not, hey, none Marie, with a flat share voice did. Yeah. Yeah. So Mar uh, Ken Murray, I've got a question on, on this. So in this time, is it you pivot your marketing or are you staying the course and staying consistent with your marketing? I, th I think it's initially the latter, right? It's making sure you're not going dark. I, yeah. I've been with companies um, that I was a CMO of a company and we went through really hard times. CEO made a decision. We're going to pull the plug. Okay, Marketing isn't as important now. I can't afford it, blah, blah, blah. I get it. Uh, it was the worst decision in the world. Mm -hmm. um, be because this same guy, Peter Field, has done research. I didn't cite it here, but it takes on average, about five years to recapture the share that you had, right? Think about it because you have to go through the customer acquisition cycle all over again. It's, it's so it's, hard to acquire customers. It's significant lost opportunity cost, right? And, um, and I, I gotta be honest with you, I fell into that paradigm for many, many years until hearing you and speaking with you. But yeah, marketing is generally the first cut that I recommend to owners, right? <laughs> you cut marketing and then you cut HR and then you cut some other, uh, <laughs> sorry about that, yeah. but but there's just certain areas, right? That you 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 cut first and, right. and, it's, and it's really, um, it's an interesting perspective. And we, we have a, uh, an owner in our community that was evaluating this recently, and they decided to actually plow through this and continue to double down and take advantage of the growth opportunity. And it's really interesting. It'd be interesting to see the results at the end, but yep. they're, we know definitively are laying people off and spending less. Yep. So if they keep with, keep with that trajectory, I mean, based upon these statistics, they should come out ahead. So, yeah. so good stuff. I mean, if you look at this, I mean, what what is the one you know the most simple way to take advantage of a time like this if I'm an owner? Well, um, to to Winter's point, it, it you know it's while I'm saying stay the course, you you do need to try some new things, right? Yeah. At, at the same time, um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you're hey, I am going to increase or double my spend. That's not what we're talking about. It's actually talking about if you think about there's there's some things you can do where you're not spending any money, yeah. right? And so and that's part of what we're trying to do in, in this series is really introduce a set of tools that people can take back to their shops and apply. Uh, some people may already be doing some of these things. You know, I, I want to leave at least one tool for each session for people to kind of take back to their teams and say, hey, what are we doing here? Are we doing any of this? You know, should we should we give it a go? Um, and then if anybody wants to talk about it, I'm I'm happy to have a jump on a call and 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 kind of talk about how, how that's done um but but the first and probably most important and easiest thing to do here um in good economy or bad is customer segmentation right and that's really understanding getting back to that definition in marketing understanding the wants and needs of your customers and understanding yourself and how those things interact so let's just dive into the customer segmentation treatment so the basic question that you have to ask is, do you treat all of your customers the same? And I think a lot of us do, frankly. You know, uh, all my customers are wonderful. Um, I need to, I, you know, I, I price them all the same. And it depends on the business that you're in. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Um, I, I provide the same level of service to all of them. Um, or I don't. And that's kind of what these groupings of, customers these different colors represent they're they're different right and they're different based on certain criteria and we'll we'll get into some of that in a, in a second here 
here's how you do it, right? So it's a simple two by two grid. Uh, on the Y axis, you've got current sales per customer. And on the X axis, you've got customer profit potential, you know, low to high. And what you wanna do, and again, it's gonna vary by industry, it's gonna vary by company, but, but take your top 20 or 30 customers, um, could be more, could be less, by current sales and kind of map them, okay? Where do they sit on the sales uh, axis? You know, high to low. Then you look at layering in, okay, of those customers, where do they sit on profit potential? Potential, not current, but what they're, what I believe or what my sales team believes the profit potential of that customer is. Is it low? Is it high? Okay, so now you kind of have these segments, believe it or not. You've created four segments out of one, okay? Then you start to think about what are, what am I gonna call these segments and how am I gonna treat them, right? So this may be a little bit rough, but you know what? Low growth, low profit, I'm gonna have to milk that relationship. Uh, I don't see a lot, and, and you're being honest with yourself, right? You're, you're not just, it's not a customer that you don't like. It's, it's, there's just not a lot of hope there. Um, low low um, growth, high profit potential. I want strategies to grow it, right? This a profitable customer. How do I get more of it, right? Um, low profit, high growth, high sales. Okay, I can live with that. Like th this is bread and butter. I may not be able to, you know, um, get them to be the most profitable customer, but I like the, I like the sales that are coming in. And then the last is uh, these are the platinum guys, right? High growth, high profit potential. They're special. They're going to get different types of treatment. Now let's look at some of those. And again, feel free to chime in or stop at any time. Well, I, um, I'm just real quick. I'm applying some operational optics to that, right? And I, I disagree with you, at least the co companies that I work with. I don't think most do this, uh, at least if you look at, you know, once again, the definition of what a small business is, which is 100 employees or below, which is 98 percent of the population don't understand this and operate. Yeah. You could actually uh, improve your services dramatically to those platinum, I think you called it or whatever. Yeah and cut significant costs out of the business if you just understood this from a marketing perspective and how to attack the market. Exactly, and, and by the way, most of the companies that we engage with, you know, whether we're coming, whether they're coming to us or we're finding them, uh, very few of them do this or do it effectively. They may say, they may have some type of segmentation and it's fine, but they don't really practice it, right? Um, I think it's probably one of those things that a lot of companies ignore because it, they know it's important. It's probably strategic and it's not an immediate return, just like process development and, and adherence, right? Companies know that process and systems help well, scale your business, but it's easier just to go with higher bodies and throw bodies at it and continue to struggle, right? <laughs> absolutely. And, and by the way, this segment right here yeah. is really hard. Yeah. Like this could be a longtime customer that I have a great relationship with. Uh, I go, uh, I golf with um, the owner and I give uh, $5,000 a year to the scholarship fund that their company is. I mean, they're, they're a great community citizen, but at the end of the day, and, and this is a, this is a decision, right? This is, this is not sometimes personal decisions, overwhelm business decisions, and we all get that, but at the end of the day, if this is strictly a business decision, you got you have to make hard decisions. You might need to increase their price, right? You might need to automate their service. They right. don't get a quarterly business review. Um, we're not going to spend much time. Um, and by the way, I'm I'm not going to be able to you know go to the golf tournament next next week uh, yeah. or next year. So it's it's things like this, right? Um, then you look in the the growth area. Uh, you know, the, the high profit potential, I'm going to spend more time there, right? Um, I'm going to try to accelerate growth. I'm going to build in some sales in incentives. Um, my, my QBR is going to be different, right? Maybe we'll talk about ways that we can innovate together. Uh, I'm want, I do want to talk to these people frequently, right? Because the, of the potential. 
And I may even have a dedicated one dedicated person there if they're big enough, important enough, et cetera. Right. Um, on the maintain side, and we don't need to go through all these, but you can see that there are specific strategies to deal with this segment, right? You want to move, every, I, in an ideal world, everybody lives up in this upper right quadrant. Um, that, that's not possible. Um, but here you're talking about, I want to meet with a CEO and work together on ways that we can innovate together. Joint, you know, I use the word generic engineering word. We're not all in engineering businesses, but working together to build things, right? Uh, that, can, that can help us both, right? It's not just that's gonna drive by sales and profit, but it's really intended to help your customer. Um, a long-term contract, and these exist obviously here um, in, in both of these, uh, higher service level, special offers, um, custom QBR, et cetera. So, so this is just one thing. You that like in, in, this is important all the time which nobody's probably, most companies aren't doing this all the time, but especially in uncertain markets, down economies where things are getting wonky, things are doing sideways. This is probably top of the list absolutely. of what they need to be doing. Yes, absolutely. Especially in the high customer profit uh, potential, right? This right side of the charts, that's really where you want to focus because when, when we get through the uncertain times, whether it's in a month, or a year, or whenever it is, they're going to stick with you. They're the people who you need, and and they are going. You're going to build a lot of trust and a lot of loyalty by doing special things for them, right? Yeah. And yeah, and these guys may stick around too because they don't have anywhere else to go, or just because you're nice people and they like you, um, even though that you you know you raise their price by twenty percent. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, yeah, it's it's about loyalty. It's about the long term, and that's what really all this is. It's not just a let's try something and see what sticks on the wall. This is a long term loyalty play. So is that is that helpful? Very yeah, helpful. that was great. Okay, awesome. Um, I think there's one. I'd like to spend one last thing, um, one last concept here, and that's about customer. So remember we talked about simplicity. We had that Steve Jobs quote up there and it's like, okay, relax. Got to keep things simple. To me, simplicity is one of the two most important concepts in marketing, right? And guess what? It's not a marketing concept. It's, it's really a, a life concept. It's like, let's keep things as simple as possible. The other of the two most important sort of terms, if you will, in marketing is customer. And that is, it's overly simplistic. Obviously, without customers, you don't have revenue. You don't have a business. But it's it's really beyond that. Um, and I wanted to share kind of an anecdote. Um, this quote here, whoops, sorry about that. This quote, think of yourself as a customer. Um, that's a, a quote that was above the doorway of every single Every single doorway, it didn't matter if it was an office, it didn't matter if it was a cafeteria, I don't think they had it above the bathrooms, but um, every, imagine every conceivable doorway at, at a company called MBNA, and you may be familiar with MBNA, I, I had the fortune of working there for 12 years, it's really where I, you know, got all my marketing chops initially. Um, they had an intense focus, and when I first went there, I was curious, like, why do we, why does it say, think of yourself as a customer? Um and it was because you you had to embrace um, it was first of all it's part of the culture, but but secondly, if you just again step back, think about simplicity and relax a little bit. If you don't think about yourself being a customer, you cannot appreciate what the customer goes through. So all of our work, regardless of what we did. Every single person in the company, and when I started, there was about a thousand people. When I ended, it was about thirty thousand. We we always ask the question: What would the customer think? Where where are we um, with respect to creating value for the customer? What what pain are we solving? And it wasn't necessarily the customer is always right because they weren't. They weren't always right. We we had debates, but it was about basically a treatment. And experience. This is really before customer experience was a huge term. We used it, but in a different way. 
And there were some things that we that we did, uh, again, just sharing the anecdotes that um, kind of drove this point home. We had something called a two ring pickup. And this was back before Slack and texting. And, you know, we actually used the telephone. We used email, too, and other forms. But but telephone was was really critical. And the point was, if you didn't pick up the phone, at least by the second ring, something was terribly wrong. Right. It didn't matter if you were on another line. You had to you had to answer that because it could be a customer. It might be, you know, someone in HR calling about, you know, a form that you need to send it, but it might be a customer. And if it is a customer, think of yourself as that customer. Do you, how annoying is it when the phone keeps ringing? Well, now it's voicemail, but it is, it was just one example. Um, You know, we had a customer listening program where, and a customer service program, everybody in the company had to do at least four hours of customer service on the front lines, right? Had to get trained and had to answer really hard, con- complex phone calls. Um, and it gave you an amazing amount of empathy, not only for the customer, but for the regular people, the regular representatives who had to, who had to either sell or service our accounts. Uh, and you learned a lot. So it was that kind of thing that really made you think about, you know, think of yourself as a customer. Those insights. Um, that's really, really important in marketing, right? But Just without real quick, by the way, that's really important in, in business and even exactly. And it's and it's really interesting to hear you speak to that because um, you know, a long time ago, uh, you know, when when I was uh, held some pretty substantial uh, sales leadership roles and I was involved with CEB. Uh, who headed up uh, Challenger Selling. And I would always tell people that CEB is like Gartner is the IT, who, by the way, then they were bought by Gartner. Yep, yep. yep. And, um, so I was one of the guys that they would lean on and, and ask questions and everything and then write a white paper and sell that for 60 grand or something ridiculous like that. But um, anyways, I remember about 10, 11 years ago, and, and the, the shift hasn't ha- happened everywhere, but there started to become a shift in sales process versus customer journey, right? And understanding how your customers want to buy, how many touches they have and everything and limiting the amount of touches. And, you know, 80% of clients rebuy because of that first buying experience, yep. right? Um, you know, the good old days, we used to have a, a sales process where like, Oh, we give you a quote and then we do this and when we do that and then we do that and then you buy, right? And there, there has been a shift even in sales as well, understanding the buying triggers and understanding how the customer wants to go through the journey and appeasing that, right? And making yes. it for them. So I think they're, you know, one of the first times that sales and marketing might be aligned. <laughs> right. And I mean, we're, we're going to be talking about that in particular uh, in, in a future session, like the critical importance of having sales and marketing aligned. I mean, awesome. in, and again, in most organizations, it's not. There's yeah. a complete, oh, you're going to provide me the leads, right? And then I'll go make the calls. Uh, and then there's this blame game. Well, your leads were crappy. No, you didn't make the calls. I'm checking, blah, blah, blah. No, you got to be aligned. You're one team, yeah. right? Um, so, I love that movie, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. You know, <laughs> it's the leads. It's the leads. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> a- absolutely. Um, and a core part of thinking of yourself as a customer, it, it really gets back to, um, you know, the growth gears. And by the way, if anybody wants a book, this is a book written by my CEO, Art, Art Saxby. Um, it, uh, just look, get, get in touch with me. Uh, I'll send you a copy. Uh, no problem. Awesome. And I think, awesome. I think you'll Thank get you. something out of that. But in order to understand, in order to have the ability to think of yourself as a customer, you need to do those, you know, get those insights. Yeah. Um, what, one of the things that we typically do um, in an engagement, we do something called voice of customer. You may have heard of that uh, voice of customer research. It, it's not a, you know, a cookie cutter approach at all because every company is different. Every company's clients are different. Um, but uh, in, a, in a recent engagement, um, I did this exercise, uh, went through voice of customer. They're a SaaS company. Um, and I talked to, and by voice of customer, I don't mean, you know, um, low, low level sort of uh, you know, a procurement specialist or something who who approved my contract. I mean the CEO, 
Yeah. I mean, the CEO is making the business decision to buy the software that my client was selling. Um, and I spent uh, over an hour with about a dozen CEOs of their company um, really to understand, OK, so, you know, what led you to buy this product? What do you think about the, the product? And, and, you know, in very, very objective uh, format for them to be able to tell me the truth. That's all, you know, I started off as a newspaper reporter. I need the truth. I don't need any gloss. You don't need to pay compliments. If they're truthful, that's great. What I need to understand is the truth. I need to understand, you know, what problems are you trying to solve? I need to understand um, how do you consume information about this industry and what do you do with it? And is it adequate? I mean, literally, you know, a hundred questions. What I got out of that um, was extremely helpful. It helped us sort of reposition the brand. But two, two things that were fascinating is one is we, we discovered there were different, many different personas that we had not previously identified, right? And by persona, I mean, you, how do you as a company use this product and what is your potential trajectory with us? Right. Are you going to be a strong user of it or are you just using it to solve a tactical problem? And by doing that, we were able to, to you know, sort of determine, you know what, there's probably a lot more companies that fit these personas. We need to create messaging. We need to create specific targeting programs that look at these specific personas. It's getting back to that segmentation thing, not just, hey, we sell great products that will solve this problem, but we we provide solutions based on what your need is. And we, since we knew what those personas needs were, we could articulate them and then position them. Right. The other thing that we learned was, you know, when we're talking about product, we learned that one of the products that they spent quite a bit of time on, meaning my client, engineering, uh, QA, uh, maintaining, nobody wanted to use, but they failed to, Either they failed to tell my client or my client failed to ask the question, which I think it's more the latter. Like, why would it, why, what problems am I solving and how are you using this product? No one had the intent to renew. So I took that information back to my client. We immediately just discontinued it, right? We took it off the shelves. Uh, we stopped all engineering resource on it. No QA. I mean, there were hundreds of thousands of dollars invested in this on an annual basis, and it allowed them to free up resource to do other stuff. And that was just by doing voice of customer research, right? Yeah. And it gets right back to this, think of yourself as a customer. Like, I need to understand really what is important to you and how am I going to solve, how am I going to solve your problem? So that, that's kind of where, really where I want to leave, um, leave this part of the conversation and, and kind of shift it back to you, Ken. Awesome, thank you. I'll go ahead and take back over if you can give me. Yep. All right, so hopefully everybody can see my slide real quick. Once again, uh, not, not here to sell, but just a quick little, I mean, first of all, Ken, that was amazing. I uh, picked up a lot of things. Thank you. you know, from the marketing perspective that I, I can apply here with us and also for our clients as well. So uh, not, a, not a sales spiel whatsoever, but just a little bit more about the shift spot. So the part that we hit today was the expert coaching section. So each month, um, this is the first time we've ever opened it up to non-members, but uh, for, the, for every month, we have a core topic that people will dial in and, and go through with experts like Ken Murray. Uh, and this month, for example, is marketing. Next month, by the way, is all about human capital and some of the issues there. So HR, we'll think of it that way. But um, throughout the community, we also provide expert coaching on a weekly basis. We have a uh, live issues resolution. So you can imagine a virtual uh, table and, and area where CEOs gather professionally facilitated by either myself or others to help solve some of the problems that they've got. So we, we use a Six Sigma approach to get to the root cause and apply real world scenario or real world solutions. So as you can imagine, things pop up all the time, such as I've got to fire my right hand man and I've never done that. 
How, how do we mitigate risk? How do we go about that process? So we uh, we do that as well. We uh, we assign an accountability coach that keeps people on track on a weekly basis. This is a 15 minute session. Uh, we, we, we review one business thing to focus on, one personal need to keep you on track there. And then just I'll hit one other quick thing and then we'll move on to uh, next week's session and also questions. But we have this really intense, uh, you know, I'll call it gap analysis. I am not a marketing guy. So all my names are very boring and everything. So I invented this and it's a process that I've used just being as a fractional leader dropping in over the years. But it's a questionnaire made up of 200 plus questions and it breaks down all the different aspects of your business from very uh, simple things such as what is your employee onboarding process? Or do you have one to complex things? Do you have financial controls in place? Right? Are you accrual or are you cash based? To you know, what are your core values? But it will break that down and it help give us insights to different areas and challenges in your business and areas that we can help make an impact and then guide you through the community. But we do this surrounding you with not only experts but other CEOs that have been there and done that. So our community is made up of some newer CEOs and some CEOs that have been there and done that and run businesses of ninety million plus to folks that have written books. Uh, from, you know, we've got a CEO that's in from Germany and others are the rest are across the United States. But that's a little snapshot of the shift spot. We encourage you to invite others to the next event, just forward them the invite and have them sign up or send us an email. And uh, with that said, Ken, why don't you go ahead and take over, tell us about next week's session and what the build is. And then let's go ahead and open it up for any questions, please. Yep, that's great. Um, just close that out. So like uh, Win Winter and Ken both said, um, this isn't necessarily, you know, I need to have been at last week's session in order to understand what next week's session is. We're, we're really just trying to provide an education resource to folks, you know, uh, decision makers. Um, next week, we're really gonna talk, I love the title. Thank you, Winter. Why <laughs> is marketing so darn hard? Um, and it's, it, it is a little bit of a build from, um, fr from this week, I suppose, in, in that, you know, hey, we went through some of the real complexities and some of the, the facts, and I just can't get my head around all these terms and all this investment and what's my team doing and how do I measure. So there's going to be aspects of all of that. We're going to talk about, you know, uh, there's, there's a big M in marketing and a little M in marketing. And the little M is kind of like the tactical stuff that you kind of have to do every day. The big N is stepping back and that's really strategy, right? It's why, why, and you know, why do I exist? I mean, it sounds like an existential question, but it's a really important. Um, and then how do I make sure that I'm pulling the right levers? What's going to be important? What's, what's meaningful um, to my customers? And then we'll obviously uh, provide um, at least one tool that you can kind of take away and use in, in your shops and share with your folks and, and see, um, you know, see if you can make some hay out of that. Um, and, and as I said, I, I'm happy to, to jump on a call if you have any questions uh, about any of that or going, going forward just to kind of help, help you walk through. This may be new to, to some of you. You, you may, all may be marketing pros too, I don't know. Um, but but again, I think it's about building out that network and, and, and building a little trust here. Yeah. So we've got on the screen now our contact information. Um, you know, please, I would encourage you to, to jump into next week's session as well and, and invite some some others to it that you think would get value out of that. And it's all about community and helping owners and CEOs just uh, get the most that they can out of life and maximize their full potential, both in life and business. But with that said, let's go ahead and open it up and see if anybody has any questions. And uh, all of this content will be sent to you afterwards as well, of which you can forward to your friends and family also. So any questions? Great job, Ken. Appreciate the wisdom. Uh, my, my pleasure, Mark. Uh, ha happy to be here. Hope, hopefully you can take uh, something away from this and uh, you know, think about uh, how, how you can, you know, power through this uncertainty that we've got right now. It's, it's, it is painful. So. Anyone else don't want to put everybody on the spot, but uh, opportunity to gain some expertise from a very high price resource, not me, Ken Murray. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> well, there, you're chasing 
Uh, yeah, there's a great comment here. Sales and marketing have been coming together for a long time and anybody doing it right has broken down those walls. Great pearls of wisdom. Yeah. Yeah. Spot on. Awesome. awesome. Well, I am I am looking forward to next week. Um, this, this entire series is all about helping um, grow your business during uncertain times. So um, it is, it is truly, and I can't wait to get to the growth gears, um, the growth gears event as well. So um, hope to see you guys next week and uh, we'll send this out and hopefully you'll invite some other business owners or CEO who may enjoy this information. All right. Thanks all. Yeah, Thanks everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.